Welcome to My Heart Murder. It's a nighttime edition, our third episode of uh, I Heart Murder. It, it is. We have had a very hectic week mm-hmm. and we are taping this actually on, like recording this actually on Wednesday night just yes. before it's got to go up because we've just been extremely busy this week. Yeah. So it's a couple of hours late, but we still get there. Better late than never. Better, definitely better late than never. Yeah. But Hopefully, I, but, Stormy doesn't wake up. But we are very tired. Mm-hmm. So we have a very big have had a very big day today. Yes. So yes. as Doug said, Stormy, she's our three year old daughter, and you'll probably see our cat in the corner, mm-hmm. or hear our cat spell on the the audio. So a little Dylan's hench pet. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, so some quick housekeeping. Um, the podcast is up where you get most good podcasts: Apple, Spotify, Google, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And um, we've been far. We have been, and the podcast, will, the audio will go up on Wednesday, and the video will go up on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Just a slight tweaking of the uh, upload schedule. schedule. Yeah. I find it works best for us, but meh. And, and we're the only people that matter in this world. <laughs> <laughs> if we were the only podcasters in the world and... Oh, wait, that song will probably be in public domain by uh, now anyway, so... Well, just don't do it, just in case. <laughs> I, that's why I switched to Rex Harrison-esque sing-speak. Oh, yes. Or speak-song. 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 Alright, so are we ready to get into our murder for this week? Oh, or you our love, our murders, betcha. Whatever. I've okay. been wondering about whom it might be. Alright, so um, this one is actually a request. Ooh. Our first request, and it is actually from one of our very good friends, Tally. Lovely. Um, and so um, it's Eric Edgar Cook. <gasps> that is definitely a Tally recommendation. Yes. Thank you, Tally. The Night Caller. The Nightcrawler. Well, that's what, that's what he was called in Nickname. all the, all the, um, yeah, that's his killer name. The, you know how all the cool killers get nicknames? The press reported, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. like the Zodiac and the, the Backpacker Murderer and... Boston Strangler. Boston Strangler, yeah. All yep. the fun people get them, them nicknames they do. Yorkshire Ripper, all those. Yep, all the fun people. All those cats. Mm. Um, and so this is, um... Other side of the country, so we're on the east coast, and this is all the way over on the west coast in Perth. Mm, the last frontier, according to several schools of thought. Well, yeah, it's like the it's like the most isolated city or something, isn't it, in the world? Uh, Perth is uh, definitely Up there. high, yeah, on the list of yeah. isolated cities compared to other cities of comparable size. It was one of the uh, last. Uh, states, areas of Australia, to be um, thoroughly colonised by uh, by white Australians. It was the last state to have the convict transportation system. It had, alongside Queensland, the most um, backwards legislation and policies regarding the Indigenous Australians. Whole... You could fill volumes with all mm. the folklore and stories about all the uh, less savoury sides of mm. Western Australia. It also takes like a week to drive there from here. Indeed. Just fun fact. I wonder, I have a cousin who lives there with her family. Yes. I wonder if she We're going to have to go visit them one day. We will indeed. I wonder if um, she and her husband will uh, ever try that uh, cross-country road yeah, trip. I don't think so. Set aside a week or something. They've got busy lives. And I think they just want to fly. I, I, I think... It takes like three hours to fly there. I know. The Insane. glories of modern travel. Anyway, I digress. Yes. Okay, so, um, Eric Edgar Cook, we'll just call him Cook or Eric. I'm not going to go through the whole three names every time. Do you want to use initials? Uh, no, because that's even more confusing. <laughs> Alright, so he was born on the 25th of February, four days after my birthday, on the 19th, ni- in 1931, all about, like, like, just a year before me, so. Yes. Um, in Victoria Park in Perth, he was born, he was the oldest... Of, I think, three. Okay. Um, he was born to Christine Cook and Vivian Cook. Um, and they basically only got married because Christine fell pregnant with Eric. Oh, shotgun wedding situation. Uh, yeah. So um, Vivian was an abusive alcoholic to the point that Christine used to sleep at her job. Um, That's very troubling already. Very. <laughs> 
on top of that, like, poor bastard, like, as a kid, poor bastard, because he hasn't killed anyone yet. Yeah. Um, born with a cleft palate, which mm-hmm. used to be called a hair lip. Yes. Um, he had two operations, one at three months, one at three and a half, so Stormy's age. Mm. She would have had two operations already. Um, uh, the operations weren't entirely successful. Um, he was left with a slight facial deformity and spoke with a mumble. If you hold that, I'll get a picture. Just this page? Yeah, don't look at it though. I'm not going to look. No looking for you. Okay. I will obscure. I will block out part of my I think that's the best photo I'm going to get. So, that's Eric Edgar Cook. So he looks like a grumpy prick. Well, so would you be if um, you'd had two operations before you were... Hey, I'm not saying I wouldn't be. I'm just saying he looks like a grumpy prick. And had the life to follow uh, that he no. did. Is that a mugshot? Uh, I believe so. It seems to be a standard one that okay. is around on most of the articles. I've got, like, this is the most research I've actually done on, on a... Um, on a um, case yet because... Um, th- I had to kind of piece together who he killed when, because they don't actually tell you in Wikipedia or Murderpedia. The sources. Yeah, which I usually do, so I had to go, like, way afield into, like, okay. heaps of different articles and stuff. But anyway. Yeah. I digress. <laughs> um, so he was, the operations weren't suc- entirely successful. Mm-hmm. He was left with a slight facial deformity, which is why he looks like a grumpy prick. Yeah. And also being in prison will do that. True that. And he spoke with a mumble. Um, with a mumble. With a mumble. Mumble, mumble, mumble. Mumble, 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 mumble. <laughs> but the mumbler did not become one of his... No, because I don't think they saw... They heard him talk when he killed everyone. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah. But maybe in, in, in court? Maybe, I don't know. But um, Anyway. I think he was called the Nightcaller before he was actually captured or something. Mm-hmm. So anyway, he... um The beatings and he got bullied at school because kids are little pricks. Yeah. Um, 30s, 40s, people were a lot less tolerant towards um, any sort of deviation from the physical and mental... Um, Normality. Yeah, or, or the perfect, the ideal state. Uh, a lot, a well, lot crueler. Like <laughs> they were a lot crueler towards disabilities and the like. Yes, it, it does sound a little bit like... Anyway, um, yeah, like kid, kid, kids are little pricks. Even yeah. now they're little pricks. Mm-hmm. Um... So the beatings that he got from his father and the bullying he got from school made him ashamed and shy and highly emotionally unstable. Uh, he ended up going to like four different schools in his primary school and early high school career. Okay. Um, he was also placed in orphanages and foster care occasionally because he would hide under his house or roam the street to avoid his dad beating him up. Mm. So he'd be put in there. But he eventually was- he would get be sent Back. Back, yeah. Great. Yeah. So, well, I don't think social services, or, or in our case, um, FACS, Family and Community Services, I think they're called. Oh. Um, I don't think they even looked it to be in existence back then. Different social norms. Also, there's issues with the social services today, and we're talking about... True that. Mm. Um, it was also frequently in hospital for head injuries. And had suspected brain damage due to an accident, due to being accident prone or, or clumsy. Right. Um, head injuries are a major factor of serial killers. Yeah, I was just thinking that. <laughs> so the fact that he's had multiple. Ooh. Um, he also suffered headaches and blackouts, but the blackouts stopped after he had a surgery in 1949. Okay. Apparently. When he would have been 18. Yes. So he left school at 14 okay. to work as a delivery boy to help support the family because his mum didn't earn enough and his dad didn't work, I'm gathering. Yeah. I didn't see anything about him working anywhere in my research. Okay. Um, I'm getting the... Um, the vibe. The vibe, yeah. Yeah. He was struck in the nose with a winch. With he, a winch. With a winch. Burned his face with steam and got second degree burns from that. Ooh. Jarred his right hand and injured his left thumb in workplace accidents due to his accident proneness or clumsiness or the fact that he'd been beaten in the head and was probably punch drunk. This could definitely be the inspiration for a very twisted black slapstick comedy from oh, everything you're telling me. I'm waiting to hear the punchline of this joke, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I still cannot do that. 
Cody and Derek. Um, Cody's my son and Derek's my brother. Keep giving me crap because I can't do the boom they ching. Do it's a running boom, joke. Boom ching. I, I just can't do it. Okay. Still, it's counterpoint. I just can't do it. You compliment what you do compliments what I do. Exactly. So yeah. you can make all the sound effects. Uh, <laughs> so starting petty crime at seventeen, he burnt down a church because they wouldn't let him into choir, and okay. served seven to, uh, eighteen months. Um, committed break and enters to steal valuables, which escalated into damaging clothing and furniture when he got out of that 18 months stint. Okay. Um, he had a newspaper collection about his crimes. He's okay. like, oh, look at me, look what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come and see me sometime? <laughs> uh, suddenly really, Mae West. Those are really bad Mae West. <laughs> <laughs> so, so far we've got Arson, arson, vandalism, vandalism, destruction of property, stealing, stealing, theft, theft, yeah, trespassing, all sorts of fun stuff, and he's not even twenty one yet. Yeah. yeah, so he was kind of like um, a very early proto, um, the, the 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 worst sort of stereotypes that give the rest of the scene a bad name of um, black black metal um, uh, followers. You know the the stereotype of the. Uh, the, the, the cultish black metal um, followers, fans in Scandinavia in the 90s who burnt down churches. Oh, the, the big scare of Satan. The big Satan satanic music. panic. Yes, yeah, satanic panic. That, that is yeah, sort of that kind Scandinavian of version of satanic although, panic. Although he doesn't, he doesn't say that he's religious in any way or anything like that. Okay. Um, but, you know. The, no, he's just a fuck up. He's definitely a fuck up, but yeah, I mean. But you can see where that comes from, you know. Hmm. Like, he left school early, he's in charge of the family at the time. Church choir is probably, like, a, a, a part of the glue of social gatherings, so it's a, a way to belong, whether you're religious or not, in mm. the late 40s in, in, in WA. But well, everybody went to church. Yeah, yeah. Ex- everybody was a good little Christian. It was, yeah, what you what you did. It was um, unseemly, I guess you could say, Um in the eyes of mainstream society to, to, to not go to, to church, whether you believed in your heart or not. Yeah. So that feeling of being excluded from that, that would not be good at all for one's no. mental health. So on the 12th of March, 1949, so the same year he got that surgery, so he might have actually gotten in jail. Okay. Um, police arrested Cook and his fingerprints were matched to several open cases of theft and stuff like that. So... Do, do, do. On the 24th of May that year, Cook, who was 18 at the time, was sentenced to three years in prison for two charges of stealing, seven of breaking and enter, and four of arson. Detective Burroughs, who was in, in charge of the case, is quoted as saying that Cook is one of life's unfortunates. So That sounds very Dickensian. Okay. Is that quote? Dickensian. Dickensian. What's that? Relating to or, or reminiscent of Charles Dickens and his works. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, Dickensian though. I wouldn't. I never would have put that in with Dickens for some reason. Okay. Or maybe it's just because I'm really tired. That, that <laughs> may have something to do with it. Um, Dirk had to wake me up to make this podcast. It is almost nine the p.m. at the moment. Full disclosure. Yeah, I fell yeah. asleep on the couch. Um, so this experience of leaving fingerprints and clues taught him to be more careful with his crimes, during his crimes in the future. Mm. Um, he joined the army when he got out of jail at 21. Okay. But was discharged three months later because of his juvenile record, not because of his adult record. So would that have been a dishonourable discharge? Um, I don't think so. It just says discharge. It doesn't say dishonourable, it just says discharge. Okay. Um, so, he was quickly promoted to Lance Corporal, though, in those three months, and learned how to use firearms. Always fun. Always fun. Um, at 22, on the 14th of October, 1953, he married Sarah Sally Levine, Lavin. They ended up having seven children. Seven children, huh? Yeah, they didn't have a TV. Well, no one had a TV <laughs> until 56, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, they were three years too early. I still, uh, dude, still fifty six. They, I had three years. I don't think they had seven children in three years, so they didn't own a TV at all. What? 
um, like I know we've um already discussed that Cook um wasn't religious, but um, what um faith denomination was his family and or his wife's Don't family say. in any of the research? Okay, so they had seven children, four boys, and three girls. Okay, and during um his marriage up until like um his major crime spree, he was arrested for peeping toms and minor offences. Mm. Okay, so. A lot of it started, and they think that his first foray into, like, releasing his anger... Yeah. Um, ...was when he ran over Nell Schneider on the 26th of September 1955. She was riding her bike, and um, he just put his foot to the accelerator and ran her over. Um, Nell immigrated from Amsterdam and was the mother of two. Um... Oh, wait, no. Nell Schneider is 26, not on the 26th of September. <laughs> right. So what um, was the date, Sil? It just says September. Okay. But she was 26. Of 55. Uh, in 1955. Yeah. Yeah. And she was a 26 uh, Dutch... Uh, immigrant. Im- immigrant. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nell got a fractured skull, severe epilepsy, and permanent brain damage from Cook, from leftover, from the, the hit and run. And she was a stranger to him. There was yeah, no stranger. no no motivation, just randomness mm-hmm. on the surface. <sighs> Unlike his next hit and run, Glenis Peak in April on April 9th, nineteen sixty. Um, he ran into her. He ran over like ran hit and run her. Um, but he knew her. How do they know each other? They they just knew each other from around the around the around the block. Oh, not an acquaintance. Yeah. Okay. He did kill someone before he ran over Glenis Peak, but they kind of went with it. Um, so, Penina Berkman mm-hmm. um, was Jewish, if you want to know her faith, because you seem to be wanting to know everyone's religion this, this podcast. Oh, just concerning <laughs> the number of children. It sounds very Catholic. Uh, it does sound very Catholic. Or yeah. just boredom. Yeah. Um, so the Gen- wireless wasn't working. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So January 30th, 1959, um, Penina Berkman was at her house. She, um, Her son had been babysat. She'd been out with the new, her new beau. Mm-hmm. And, um, because she's divorced and stuff. And, yeah. Uh, Cook came through, came in through an open window into Penina's bedroom and stabbed her naked body repeatedly with a 17 centimeter diving knife. Again, the, the the rage in stabbing, in, yeah. Yeah. In knife crimes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and he didn't know her. He just randomly, doors open, off I go. Yeah. Whoever I see next will... Yeah, yeah stab this naked chick. Mm-hmm. Um, so his biggest crime. It's, it's called the Australia Day Rampage. Mm-hmm. But it's actually the day after a straight day rampage. Okay. I just don't think it looked sounded as good in the newspapers. Probably not. Yeah, the day after a straight day rampage. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the day after tomorrow. January 27th. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, January 27th, 1963. Mm-hmm. Um, in Cottesloe. Uh, Rowena, Rowena Reeves and Nicholas August, who were having an affair. Ooh, Ooh quite the scandal. We're having a, a, a drink at um, a car park, and apparently Rowena was in the back, and Nicholas was in the front, so nothing gone toward happening, apparently. Okay. And um, they noticed someone around the car. And so Nicholas threw a beer bottle and told Cook to clear off. Cook turned around, grabbed his rifle, and shot at them. Rowena saw the gun and pushed Nicholas's head down into the front seat, mm-hmm. but the n- bullet went through Nicholas's neck and into Rowena's wrist. Um, they ended up booking it and and, and speeding off. And, yeah, and getting the hell whatnot. out of Dodge, they, yeah. they survived. Um, but then Cook walked down Brown Street, Broom Street, sorry, Broom Street. Mm. Broom's another city in Western Australia, or another town in Western Australia. Indeed. Um, but walked down Broom Street... He climbed onto a garage roof, that was also a balcony, and shot Brian Weir, a 29-year-old accountant, through an open set of doors. 
Just shot him in the head. Just oh. random bloke shot him in the head. Yeah. So, Paul Bryan, he was in a coma for six months and was left severely brain damaged, blind in one eye, deaf in one ear, paralyzed on the right side, and unable to speak at all. So, this is the second uh, victim who survived, but horrific. So, um, because there was two people in the car. I know, but this is the second um, one of his victims whom you've spoken about so far that we've got the in-depth descriptions mm. of the, uh, the the damage, the trauma they yeah. so came I, away from. Yeah. yeah, they had an interview they were, in one of the articles, that, and I'll reference all the articles at the end. Um, in one of the articles, there was an interview with his brother. Yeah. And he lived for six years, and his brother said he... He didn't survive. He was just killed very slowly. And, like, that he was murdered that night. Yeah, well, you've got to remember, you've got to keep in mind um, that uh, the, the, the victims, that the negative impact that, that murderers have, that criminals like mm. these have, it extends well beyond, obviously, those who are killed. Yeah, well, yeah. Like, Brian's brother said that he lost his best mate that night because Brian was never the same again. And obviously so, like... Not only the injuries, but the, the trauma from those injuries. I get this image from what you tell me of sort of like a, a, a cold, slow, methodical, almost um, sniper mentality. It, I, 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 the military Maybe. Training, he wasn't really maybe. in there for that much long, though. He was only in there for three months. Yeah. So it's not like he really had that culture drummed into him like someone that's been in there for 20 years or whatever and loses his rocker. True, but it's it's interesting um, the, 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 the connections that have been uh, made and the, uh, the literature that uh, exists about uh, war veterans and people who have undergone military training mm. in both real life and in fiction who have later gone on to um, become criminals yeah, and or killers, the, serial killers. They usually have been in the military culture for a long time. And often have um, had combat experience. Yeah, I just think um, Eric Cook is just a complete nut job product of his upbringing and the society upbringing. at the time. Yeah. Like, he's literally just a product of of how he's been brought up in this world. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. But he still could have gone somewhere else apart from killing people. That's it. He's still a murderer. Mm. Sorry, Tortle. Tortle's our cat. It's all good, Tortle. Well, one of our cats. One of our two cats. Um, the other cat is unlikely to make an appearance. No, because he's an asshole. Yes. And he's also uh, camera shy for the uh, visual portion of this. Uh... No, he's just an asshole. Yeah, that too. <laughs> um, so, the next... Victim is George Walmsley. He's 55, a retired grocer. Uh, Cook rang his doorbell at 11 a, uh, at 3 a.m. Woke him, his wife, and his daughter. So, Walmsley, being the man of the house, George goes down to answer the door at this ridiculous hour. Gets shot in the freaking head for answering the door. <sighs> And that's how his that's how his wife and daughter find him with a bullet hole in the middle of his forehead, just with the door open. Just to, uh, I'm 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 guessing it was just um to the door and straight away open the door. Yeah. Probably no security. Um. No. This, uh, this is when you didn't lock your car, you didn't lock your house, you slept with windows open. Of course, a safer, more innocent time. Yeah, yeah definitely a safer, safer, more innocent time, and I think also because of. Perth's isolation, it, it, it's a bit different than, say, Sydney or Melbourne. Mm. Like, in Sydney and Melbourne, even at this, in the 1960s, you really wouldn't leave your door unlocked. Or your yeah. windows unlocked. Definitely or not. answer the door without looking, because there was much more crime mm. at that time. But here in Perth, um, they say that it was a very innocent time. And people just, like, Cook used to steal cars every night because people used to leave their keys in the car. Um, Indeed, a far different time. Yes. So the last person he killed in the Day After Australia Day rampage um, was John Sturkey, who was 19. He was an agricultural science student 
who was shot in while he slept on the veranda of a boarding house. Now, a lot of people who listen to this may be like, oh, January, it's cold. Not here. No. <laughs> in Australia, it Definitely is not. boiling ass hot. It's mm-hmm. in the middle of win- uh, It's middle of summer. And I wouldn't blame him for sleeping on the veranda in Perth. Perth gets bloody hot. You do what you've got to do for comfort. Yeah. And as you said, more innocent time. Yeah. And he's 19. Like, that Superman bravado, nothing can hurt me kind of thing. Yeah. Um... So that was in January of 19, 1963. In February of 1963, Cook strangled a social worker, Constance Madrill, 24. Couldn't find much information about her at all, or the crime. Okay. Just know that he strangled her. And then on the 18th of August, 1963, um, Cook shot Shirley McLeod, an 18-year-old student who was babysitting at the time. How would you be? Mm. Oh, yeah, I'm just babysitting these little kids, getting some extra money for uni, or probably uni at 18. Yeah. Or year 12 or whatever. Um, Last form, going into university. Yeah, and, and then he just gets shot. Yeah. Why are you sitting there? All those quotidian um, aspects of um, everyday life, you know, just unsuspecting, being asleep, um, being woken up from sleep, mm. babysitting. Yeah. Oh, I think about um her charges, the kid or kids. Yeah, exactly. Under her care. Hopefully they slept through the whole thing and didn't wake up until mummy and daddy got home. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, I would be very interested. Yes. To find out more information about that particular case. There isn't a lot. No. No, that considering that he that Cook would actually be considered like a heavy hitter, in quotation marks, of Australian history murder history. Yeah. There isn't a hell of a lot of information about his actual crimes. There's more about his life and his trial and all that. But the actual crimes, I had to do a lot of digging just to get the timeline, let alone what actually happened. Ah, have there been any books, biographies, book Probably. chapters? And there is a um, documentary. Okay. Didn't have a chance to watch it this week, but I do want to. What's the name of it? Oh, I'll find it for you. Thank you. I'll get it for you. Um, it's going on the list. There's going to be an ever-growing list, probably, of pop culture coming out of the exploits of there's the characters always, we cover. There's always a list, isn't there? Um, so, yeah. It, it, and it's a... Um, Crook, Cook's crimes brought on this whole wave of terror in Perth. Of and the problem was... Because his crimes were opportunistic, mm-hmm. and um, he didn't use, he didn't have a standard MO, mm-hmm. like he had various methods of killing people, he was very, very difficult to catch. Also, his victims had no commonalities because they were just randomly chosen. So there's no evident patterns. There's no evident patterns. The only person who he knew was Glenys Peak. Um... All the rest, he didn't know. So the cops would have had a really hard time trying to to catch this guy. Mm. And they actually got a break. This el- these early people that are out, like, flower picking or, or hiking or something. Okay. And they came across this gun, right? A rifle. I think it was a 22, 20 rifle. Yeah. And so what the cops did is they substituted the rifle... I think when they say substitute, they like took the firing pin and that out. Okay. And um, left it where they found it mm. and waited for the killer to come back. And that's how they got Cook. Right. Which is actually really smart. That's a really clever plan, It was plan, a really actually. clever ruse. It was great. Yeah. Got to be more careful if you're a, um, a criminal with mm-hmm. uh, the uh, location. Definitely. The treatment of your weapons. Definitely. Yeah. And so... Um, that was in September 1963, so okay. only a, a, like a, a, a month after he yeah. shot the babysitter. Mm. Um, so he tried to plead guilt, uh, tried to plead um, not guilty via um, insanity. Reason of insanity, as, yeah. As most most um, murderers try to roll that dice, yes, especially serial killers. Mm-hmm. Um, but he got the death penalty um, while his psychologist and that said yes he's got schizophrenia blah 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 
the state appointed psychologist said, nah. 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 He might be completely bonkers, but he's sane. Yeah. So, overruled. Oh, yeah. So, he got the death penalty. He got the death penalty. Um, and Cook accepted it quite calmly and actually told his lawyers not to apply for an appeal. Okay. He just said, I deserve to get what I got. I deserve to to die for what I've done. Blah, blah, blah. That's something that Which you is actually don't quite... always hear from the no. mouths of the convicted. No. And also, you normally hear, oh, I didn't do it, right up until the time they're, they're like, electric chaired or gassed or... Hung. Hung or... Until the time in, of their last words. Injected or whatever. Last meal, last words. A lot of people are going, no, I'm innocent, I didn't do this. No, 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 no. Whereas this is actually a guy that said, yeah, I did it. Did he ask for um, the, the families of his victims to, uh, to, to forgive him? Did he invoke no. God at all? No. Okay. He's just like, I did it. Kill me. Very un-American, isn't it? <laughs> well, we're not American, darling. That's very true, darling. Um, and on the 26th of October, 1964, he was the last man hanged in WA. He would have been one of the last... I think he was the last. ...people... Uh, ...or very close to being the last. ...executed in this country. Yeah. Uh, yeah, three years before um, Ronald Ryan? Yeah, I'm not sure. He would have been one of the very last. Yes. Because we, we did get rid of... 67. Capital punishment? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always get that and corporal confused, and it's really bad to get them confused. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And he is buried at Fremantle Cemetery right near um, Baby Killer Martha. Well, there you go. There's actually a rumour that he's actually on top of Baby Killer Martha, which we will do in a later episode. Because you know how the, the prisons like to recycle their graves and shit. Yes, I'm just thinking there's scope there for a, a dirty really joke. Really bad dirty joke, dude, mm. so no. No, like maybe you can like have that opportunity when you get around, when we get around to doing oh, that, yeah, maybe. that episode. But yeah, um, Frio connections in, uh, in the afterlife mm-hmm. for criminals in the cemetery, eh? Mm. Yeah, so... Um, so... Yeah, last person in WA Hanks. Okay, in 1964. Yeah, and just before he died, he got his little got a little Bible out. You know how the courts like their Bibles. Yep. And he swore in front of a chaplain that he actually killed um, Gillian Brewer and Rosemary Anderson. Now, I'll explain who they are. All right. So in 1959. Chocolate heiress Gillian Brewer was stabbed to death with a tomahawk and a pair of scissors in her flat in Cotter's life. Mm-hmm. So it went kind of with his MO. Yeah. Right, and he said that he did it. Um, it was... The courts did not accept his confession to begin with. Um, and, and they wanted to keep the guy they already had in prison. So... Daryl Beamish was already in prison for this crime of Gillian Brewer's death. Yeah. He is a deaf mute. He was a deaf mute, or is mm. a deaf mute. I think he is still alive. Okay. He's a deaf mute, and he was sentenced to death in 1961 for the crime of killing Gillian Brewer. Um, in 2005, finally, in 2005, his, convi- years later. his conviction was squashed. And in 2011... He was awarded just under five hundred thousand dollars for wrongful imprisonment by the, the Western Australian government. Fifty years later. Fifty years later. Do you think that's a fair amount? No, I really don't. I think that's very um, small potatoes. I I I, I personally think he mm-hmm. was uh, undercompensated there. Yeah, but then there's Rose Marie Anderson's murder, and she was a seventeen-year-old who got hit by a car by Cook in 1963, just before he's got... Mm. And um, she had a disagreement with her boyfriend, John Button, got out of his car, went off and walked a half... Like, had a, had a half and, and walked off. He took about five minutes, right, just to calm down John Button. Mm. And in that five minutes, he saw this car go past him. That was Cook. And Cook hit Rosemary. John didn't see this. And then when he went to go look for Rosemary, he found her body. And he got done for the murder. Ooh. He, well, he got done for manslaughter. Yeah. He was, um, 
sentenced for ten years and got and served five. Mm. Um, and that was because of Cook's confession, I think. Don't quote me on that one. Couldn't find any more information. Yeah. So that's what um, happened there. And now what happened was the reason why he served that long. Mm. Um, no, he served five years and then he got let out and then he was trying to get his conviction overturned so that he could go on and live a normal life, right? Yeah. So he could get work and stuff like that. And no one would believe that Cook's story, which was that his car hit her. Yeah. It was an old timey Holden. It mm-hmm. had a sun visor on it, right? Okay. Like an out, out, so outdoor sun visor, like on the exterior of his car. Yeah. And the courts could not believe that he could hit Rosemary, the body go over the car, like Cook said, mm. and the visor's not damaged. So just the 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 the, the physics and the cause and effect. Yeah, the, ju- the, the, the judges couldn't believe it, right? Actions and reactions. Or the courts couldn't believe it. And yeah. now a journalist, Estelle Blackburn, who also... Re- Wrote, writ, wrote the book, in the 1998 book, Broken Lives, which was about the innocence of John Button and I think also Daryl Beamish. Okay. Um, during the, the writing of that book, they got um, crime scene investigators and that to get the same kind of holding and run over a crash test dummy. So reenact it. Reenacted it, and that's what happened. Okay. The body went up and over... The visor flexed, but it didn't break, and the paint didn't crack. Sounds like a bit like Mythbuster so, Crime Busters. Well, that's basically what Crime Scene Investigators are. Yeah. Bit of so, a clunky title, but you know what yeah. I mean. So, Cook was right. His confession was what happened, and so John Button got let off. Um, so he got... Um, it got his conviction got squashed in 2002. Mm-hmm. Um, after testing on the car visor, and he was awarded just under five hundred thousand dollars too. Mm-hmm. And I think there is um, a, a couple of documentaries about John Button and that too. So if you want more information, just look up John Button or I think something like that, and you should get um, these documentaries and okay. that about how mm-hmm. they did the testing and stuff. Nice. True crime has been hot for quite a while now. It has, mm-hmm. and it's very fascinating. Um, but I think. John Button's um, conviction overturn mm-hmm. is what um, got Daryl Beamish's overturn three years later. So okay. I, I think the what, precedent. Yeah, I think the investigation that Button did to free him yeah. helped also to free Beamish. Which oh, is, right. Which was an unexpected bonus. So let's, especially if there's a public outcry, let's look into all of the um, all of the, uh, the 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 old. Uh, Cases that we previously fought um, were were done and dusted. Yeah, well, clear cut. Um, well, yeah. there is one guilty party. That's the good thing about science. Like mm. every time new evidence comes along, you you change your mind. Yeah, like me personally, when the whole first climate change argument came around, me being a geology like geology student. Yeah, in my bachelor of science, I was thinking, oh, it's okay. It's like, I was trying to reassure myself yeah. with science, saying, oh, it's okay, we're in an ice house period anyway, mm. the earth should be heating up, but I ended up changing my mind because we shouldn't be heating up this fast. Retesting the hypothesis. Yeah. Um, yes, we are in an ice age period, mm. ice house period, sorry, but we shouldn't be heating up the way we are. So there is, humans are making a massive and detrimental moment in in Earth's history. We're leaving a huge negative carbon footprint. Yeah. One so of the pressing issues of our age. Yes. So yes. I'll get off my little climate change soapbox now. But um <laughs> so there isn't the as I mentioned Let's before. climate change the subject. <laughs> Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> so in nineteen ninety eight, um Estelle Blackburn, who helped John Button prove his innocence, wrote the book Broken Lives and it's all about um John Button. Yeah. And and how he got basically owned for someone else's crime. Mm. So, yeah, that's basically the story of Eric Edgar Cook and how messed up the dude was. Eric Edgar Cook is uh, 
differs from the the subjects of our two previous episodes in the fact that he was uh, a he's, parent, he's, a father. He's also a serial killer. True, but a father to seven children who would have been, what, 10 or oh, under no. at the time of his... Sorry, William McDonald last week was a serial killer as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whoops. That's all good. My, I'm still the, a bit tired. The fan base will forgive you, but I think about uh, his children. Like, I don't know if they are all still uh, alive or, or not nearly, um, nearly 60 years on, but uh, how would it... What would it be like to, um, you know, even even if you're, you know, sort of like hidden, not spoken about in the in the in the press coverage, and there may or may not be you know, police or or organizational protection given to you, but just that stigma around you that your dad was a person who committed all these crimes. True that, but I think their mother, Sally or Sarah. Yeah. Um. I think her name was Sally. Uh, Sarah. Her name was Sarah, but her nickname was Sally. So, uh-huh. um, I think Sarah tried to protect them as much as possible. Like okay. on the day that, on the day that Cook was hanged, she had a sign on the door saying, "Please just leave us alone." Yeah. So I think she was quite protective of her kids. Yeah. Um, just from her actions, not not really anything, anything specific, but I just have this feeling that she would. Like a bit protective of her kids, and I wonder if she. I mean, I wonder what was you know the the home life like. Did she suspect anything? Did she know anything? What well, was his stories? You know, they, they don't out? really go into his relationship with Sarah. Um, That's a damn shame. I would think, considering his actions, that he may be like his parents. Like in the fact that he might be a bit more on the violent side. I don't think he'd be as bad as his dad. No. But I do think he wouldn't understand how to be a father in any other way. And the way that he's reacted and and gone and, and killed all these people and mm. had these urges of like running people over in cars and that. It wouldn't surprise me if he was an abusive father and, and husband. But it doesn't actually say anything, so that's just pure speculation. Yes, more research pending. Yeah. yeah. There, as I said, there is not a lot. Speaking of research, so I've got um, Wikipedia. There's a fairly good article, but as I said, like, you heard me just talk about his murders and that. Yeah. That's the murder spree. Okay. Section. So, All right, this you might is want the to murder write, spree yeah. section. So, out of the whole article, that's it for the murder spree. Okay. So, um... And it lists his victims, but it doesn't list what ones or when, and they're not even in order. And uh, Well, you did very well with expanding it. So there's a Wikipedia article on Eric Edgar Cook. There's also a Murderpedia article, mm-hmm. which is where I got information as well. There is, um, in The Age, uh, 15 years ago, there was um, uh, one on the new clues, new clues in the heiress kill case, which is about Gillian Brewer. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't say who it was written by, so I can't give any shout out for that one. Um, there is a, um, follow up with, um, Panina's son, Panina Berkman's son, called Panina Berkman's family find the pieces of, missing pieces of history, and that's in Perth Now, the newspaper, and it was written by Tony Barras. Back in 2019, so that's only a year old. Mm. Quite um, recent. Yeah, that's, as I said, more about her son. Um, Eric Edgar Cook, the Nightcaller, was one of Australia's worst serial killers in 60s trials. This was in 2012 in the Herald Sun, and that was written by Emily Webb. As I said, I had to go through a lot of articles. Um, And in the Western Australian, there's No Escaping Unharmed for Cook's Victims back in 2013 um, by Joseph Catanzaro. Um, If you want any of these articles or links to any of these articles, just give me an email. Um, The email is iheartmurder2 at gmail.com. Just send me an email and I'll send it back. The links to all the articles. So, um, what do you think of the night call, honey? I think that it's a fascinating uh, look 
at the 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 dark side, the uh, the the underbelly of the urban Western Australian experience. Now, this may go back to Western Australia's early history exploration of of the state, that area. Um, Ex exploration and and the like, but uh, uh, f f there's this idea of the remoteness, the barrenness of much of uh, Western Australia, which is fodder for, for nightmares. Think think Wolf Creek, the film, and the uh, and and the later the television series, and all of the all of the true crime that that was. Based upon mm. in yeah, well, that wasn't just based on one case though, Wolf Creek. Yeah, but outback Australia, yeah. you know the the nightmare fuel of 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 that. But this is this is urban. Mm. This is an urban horror story. Something that I find extremely interesting, and as you said, the TV was only recently new. They wouldn't have really had um, broadcasts from America that much. But his murder spree lines up with the beginning of the spike of. Serial killers in America mm. in the 70s and 80s. Also, he got so many hits in the head, and that is a major factor in the serial killers in the States as well. Yes. So, um, it's just very interesting that one of the most isolated cities, and it goes on this timeline is, again, mm. like the mid-century, um, well, from the 50s, 60s, yeah. Through to the 80, 80, 80, 80s, 90s. Following on from last week. There was like this massive spike of serial killers in a, in America. And this is when our serial killers really started coming to the fore with America, uh, with um, William McDonald and Eric Edgar Cook. And mm -hmm. towards the end of the period, you've got Ivan Milat and, and mm -hmm. um, Snowtown and... And that, and we still haven't gotten all the social upheaval uh, in uh, Australia and Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War as the sixties wore on. No, hello, no. Tortle. Hello, again, Tortle. Um, so like, it's just very interesting the parallels that that you can get from like the most isolated city, one of the most isolated cities in the world, and probably would have been at that time. Mm. Um, even more than now. Still following that 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 trend of serial killers, which I find is extremely interesting. Because you can't really say, oh, yeah, they got the idea from America, because I don't think they'd be getting much from America. Like, they wouldn't be getting, like, the nightly, the, like, nightly news from America. It would be Australian nightly news and stuff like that. Yeah, you'd be getting it at a remove. You'd be um, getting it from, uh, from, from radio broadcasts, from, from the cinema, from, from international news. Yeah, but it wouldn't be, like... You couldn't go and watch a documentary like you can now and find out how they kill people and stuff like that. It would just be, oh yeah, kill or whatever, got caught. Or, yeah, it's or... a more limited uh, pool reserve of, of information. Uh, yeah, and it's, and it's like this in, the, in this time between the 50s and the 90s. There seems to be this massive global upheaval or, or up, uptick of serial killers. Mm. So why? Why is this... Why is it in this time? Why? Why? I'm reading a book at the moment. The book we picked up at the bookshop. Yeah. Earlier, about this serial killer I've never even heard of in um, Nepal and that area of the world. And it's in the 60s, 70s. Like, what is it about the world between 1950 and 1990 that all these serial killers came out of the woodwork and got caught or did their business or... Whatever. What is it? The Cold War, proxy wars like Indochina and Algeria, um, changing societal and and moral and ethical norms, a more permissive society, breaking down of censorship. Breaking down of um, gay rights and stuff like that too. Like you look at Harvey Milk. Breaking down I, I know of that, gay rights. But like breaking down the, the, the rules around it and being more accepting. Becoming more more militant and coming out from the uh, the underground yes, and trying to yeah, that's what I meant to say. Like, just trying I, to gain basic human I, rights. I'm just thinking because I watched a thing on Harvey Milk the other day. Yeah, even though the guy that killed him, uh, Dan White, I think his name was. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry if I got that completely wrong, guys. 
I know Australian history much better than I know American history. It's all right. We can just do an apology. <laughs> I'm, I'm apologising now if I got any of that wrong. I'm not 100% um, sure about the particulars. But he wasn't a serial killer, but he killed Milk because of... It was an assassination. Yeah. It was an assassina- assassination. And yeah. you've also got massive assassinations in that time, too. You've got yeah. JFK. You've got um, his brother. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Kennedy. Oh, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Kennedy. Um, you had, um, attempted assassination. It's just, it's insane that in that period, for some reason, there was just this uptick of serial killers. And there have been assassinations, and there have been wars, and there have been all that throughout history. Human history. Because humans cannot get along. Mm. And there's always someone arguing with someone else about what colour their skin is, or what god they, they want to hail, or... If they're a girl, or if they're gay, or whatever, people don't like people, and it's stupid, and you should all just get along, and let people be who they are. It could be the generation gap, too. But, for some reason, in that period of time in human history, there has been so many serial killers, worldwide. Why? Like, I'm not saying there's been no serial killers before, or no serial killers after, but why is it this worldwide thing? Like there are serial killers here, there are serial killers in um, America, there are serial killers in Asia that I've read about in this time. They're everywhere in Europe. Why at this time? I just don't, I don't get it. It's one of those things that I am researching and it's part of my research and I just want to understand why. And I don't know if I'll ever get an answer. What we didn't touch on with uh sorry uh, my rant is over now <laughs> with the um location of perth in mm. western australia it was also um uh, a locus it was a major uh embarkation point for uh immigrants from all over the world mm. and more parts of the world um as the 60s wore on getting into the 70s the uh the whitlam era I mean, my um, my mother and, and and her family they landed in in Perth, in, and, then in Perth and then and then headed headed east. Mm. Yeah, in 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 the sixties. I'm not entirely. That's a personal. I'm yeah. not entirely sure where Omer and Opa landed after World War Two, but I'm, they might have landed in Perth and then moved their way over here because they did shoot roost for a bit. You have a um, a sort of a melting pot situation. Uh, as a as a as a migrant city, but you also can get um, influences, socio cultural yeah. etc. coming through that way. Yeah. Well, too. Nell, the first person he ran over, Cook ran over, was Dutch, and mm. I'm half Dutch. My grandparents came over here after World War Two on the the what was it five pound Aussies or something, and ten pound ten, pounds, ten, ten pound Aussies, ten pound pounds, whatever. They, they came over on the ship after World War Two, mm. and chose Australia out of about six other countries. So, mm. so uh, Australia is a very multicultural place. But, yeah, so Perth has got mm, like a lot of immigrants there. Mm. So, as far as I'm aware, if you're from Perth and you disagree with anything that we say, let us know. Please leave we'll, a comment. And, and we'll, we'll fix it up. We'll apologise or whatever. <laughs> do penance. Yes, we will do penance. Oh, Perth, Perthinians, please forgive us. Yes, um, include a swan in the ritual. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, a little black one. Of course, yes. Yeah. I won't kill it. Yes, no, no blood, no, no blood ki- rituals. No yeah. killing, just yes. holding of the black swan. And, That's it. And saying, oh, black swan, I love you, because they're cute. They're, they're cute so as balls. so cute, absolutely. You are tired, aren't you? Oh, so tired, dude. Yeah, so also, in, <laughs> to be possibly included in a future... Correction slash apologies, as we've said several, several times, this is uh, a very atypical time for us to be recording this podcast. So it seems a bit more fun, though. It certainly does. Mm. That whole um, sleep stoned, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sleep stoned, my cat's here, headspace. So my cat's here, keeping my leg warm. I hope you've all enjoyed our our ramblings. Yes, I don't. I wouldn't call us sub- more subdued than usual, but. No, no, not really. But um, a little bit more random, maybe. More rants. Yeah, more rants from me, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, just, yeah, 
drop us a line on under the video or, or give us an email. Reach out on any of our social media. We have Twitter, mm. um, iHeartMurder3 on Twitter. Because obviously murder, lo tw murder, murder people love Twitter. Mm -hmm. iHeartMurder3 on Twitter. iHeartMurder2 on Instagram and email. Uh, iHeartMurder on YouTube mm. and on all podcasts. Please leave engagement, feedback, constructive criticism. Yeah. All that good stuff. Suggestions yes. of more murderers that you want. Doesn't have to be Australian. Just we will give our little Aussie humour and twist to it. Doesn't have to be Australian. But I just cover Australian because I know more about Australia. And thank you, Tally, you amaze balls, beautiful. Thank little you human, for the suggestion. For the suggestion. Tally. It was a lot of fun, and it was actually quite difficult to do the research, so it was a bit of a challenge for me, so thank you very much. And we hope you enjoy this episode. We hope you all enjoy this episode. Yes, but definitely the person who suggested it. Yes. Tally, thank you. And we'll see you soon, hopefully. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, well... And I hope you all enjoy the, enjoyed the uh, appearance, the uh, guest appearance yeah, by... Yeah, our, our cat. By Tortle. Yes. <laughs> this one's a social one. Mm. But yeah, um, so yeah, we'll see you next week. Bye! Bye.